Welcome everyone. I'm Jen Shogger from the NJ Ace. I am so honored today to have Rabbi Rudy Regan here with us. Um, Rabbi Rudy Regan is a visiting scholar at the Harvard Law School Project on Disability and previously served as rabbinic disability scholar in residence at Matan. She's an inclusion trainer and researcher and the author of the realsocialskills.org blog on reframing social skills inclusively. Her interests include communication access, ritual aspects of inclusion, and social emotional skills for educators and disability professionals. Rabbi Rudy is joining us today and will be presenting on respect and reciprocity with people who have communication disabilities. Um, Rudy's gonna present and then I'll be back on so that we can chat at the end. Welcome, Rudy. All right. So, Welcome everyone. It's great to be here with you today to talk about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, um, which is respect and reciprocity with people who have communication disabilities from a perspective of assuming that communication is everyone's responsibility and that everyone has, part of that means that everyone has the responsibility to develop inclusive social skills for communication. Um, and to give a sense of where I'm coming from, so I think it's very important to take an inclusive approach to what we mean when we talk about social skills, because we know that in the autism world specifically, social skills is often kind of a euphemism and almost a slur sometimes, and it mean it can be used to kind of reference a social deficit model of autism and autistic people. It's like defined as the ways that autistic people are different in need of correction, which is not really what it should mean. So I think social skills is a much more useful concept when we take it literally. And when we think about like social skills are getting really good at doing right by ourselves and others in our interactions in practice, not just in theory, not just theoretical respect, but in practice, what do we do? So, Another way to frame this is the way Dave Hingsberger has put it, um, is the most important social skill is reciprocity, like reciprocal interactions with other people where we care about them, we communicate, and it's a two-way street. So what do I mean by communication is a two-way street? I mean that there's two parts of it. There's listening and there's the expressive part. So we've got to work to understand people. We have to work to be understandable. And there's a way that communication gets framed by default in our culture where reciprocity looks a certain way and only really takes into account a certain range of people. Um, and it often really focuses on verbal speech and a certain type of body language, eye contact, that sort of thing. And that can leave out a lot of people um, because we're not necessarily socialized in the same way with the expectation that we need to be understandable to people who have receptive communication disabilities and that we need to list, listen to and develop the skills to listen to people whose communication might be different in various ways. Sometimes it's simple things like somebody who has CP might have a really thick disability accent. And often people with disability accents often don't get listened to, not because they're impossible to understand, but because other people don't feel an obligation to listen when listening looks different. It's so, also when people don't speak or speak in an atypical way, often there's a tendency to forget that listening to people whose communication is something other than speech or whose speech is unusual in various ways, listening might take different skills, but listening is still our responsibility if we want to be in reciprocal role relationship with someone. So I think communication is a two-way street always, and we need to own our responsibility in that regardless of who we're communicating with. So how do we do that? 
part of it, and part of this presentation is going to be kind of abstract, part of it's going to be concrete, um, because I think that there's principles that we need to understand, but we can't just talk theoretical, we have to actually talk about what do we do and how do we get better at it. But this is the bedrock principle I think that we need to be starting from, is that everybody has a perspective and everybody's perspective is important. Um, that whether or not somebody can communicate clearly in a way that we understand, they're a fully human person. Whether or not we know what they're thinking, they're thinking and their thoughts are important. And they don't become unimportant when we don't have access to them. It just means we don't have access to them right now. And regardless of someone's degree of impairment or what it looks like or how much trouble we have with communicating them, people own their own lives. And people understand whether or not we're respecting them. So we need to start from the, from the assumption that everyone is someone, everyone has a perspective, and that we need to be listening and we need to be communicating. And this is countercultural. Um, because when we don't know what someone is thinking, there are all kinds of ways in which we're sort of socialized to forget that they are thinking or to even treat someone else as speaking for them. Really, everyone's their own person, regardless of impairment, regardless of our difficulties in understanding them. And we have to really keep in mind, always under all circumstances, that everyone is their own person, everyone has their own voice, and communication is a two-way street. So this is a place where I see really significant disconnect on that point, especially when people have or are perceived as having significant intellectual disability or significant cognitive impairment um, off, or significant communication impairment. Often people have this idea that they can be someone else's voice and you can't. Like no one can be someone else's voice. People can only speak for themselves. We can advocate for others, but we can't be someone else's voice because we're not them. Loving or caring about someone does not make us them. And trying to act in somebody else's best interest does not make us them. Only one way to hear someone's perspective is to listen to it, and there's no proxy for that. Sometimes there's proxy decision-making um, for various reasons, and we can argue about what the parameters of that are or should be, but sometimes, you know, for various legal reasons, somebody might have someone else making their decisions for them in to various degrees, but that doesn't make them their voice, and that doesn't make them the same person, and I think that, I know I'm belaboring this point a little, but I'm doing that because I think it's important, and I think it's easy to overlook. Regardless of what someone's legal rights are, there's still someone, there's still a different person, they still have their own perspective. We still need to listen to them and not treat another person as substituting for their personhood because people are different people, regardless of legal circumstances, regardless of impairment. So what do I mean by listening? Um, Part of it is that listening starts from making it clear that we care what someone's thinking, we care about their perspective, we want to understand. Listening also means trying to understand, trying to figure out what is someone trying to tell us? What do they mean? How do we know? Checking our understanding to make sure that we're not just listening to someone we're imagining, we're listening to what the person we're communicating with is actually telling us. Adjusting our communication to be more understandable and treating their perspective as intrinsically important. So a caution about this, especially for people with certain clinical training, is that there's a difference between trying to listen to someone and trying to make someone feel heard. Feeling heard is an emotional response. It's not the same as being understood. And the clinical training that some of us have in making people feel heard or making people feel safe can sometimes end up being a barrier because we can prompt the emotional response of, 
causing someone to feel heard and causing ourselves to feel that we have heard them without actually creating mutual understanding. So I think especially those of us who have had that kind of training, and it can be helpful, it can be helpful, it can be helpful in creating a frame, but we need to understand the limitations. We need to understand that people need more than validation and that understanding perspective is different from creating the I've been heard emotional response. How do we know if we're listening? How do we know if we're communicating? I think there's three questions that we should always keep asking ourselves. What can I do to understand better? What have I done to understand? What can I do to be more understandable? And how do I check to see whether I'm getting it right? Both in the sense of how do I make sure that I'm actually being understood? How do I make sure that I'm actually understanding the perspective I think I'm understanding and getting it right? And again, like ask, taking space to ask these questions of ourselves explicitly um, really helps because it's something that is not natural in our culture. It's something we have to do on purpose. And this is a way to concretize it that I found really helpful. So part of listening too is making sure that we're making space for all forms of communication. Speech is not always the best form of communication for everyone, including people who can talk or people who can sometimes talk. The fact that somebody can say some words does not mean that saying some words is the only form of communication they have or need. Um, so it's important for us to not treat speech as the end all and be all, not treat it as a prerequisite, to work to understand the communication that somebody is actually using. And, you know, and we, communication takes many forms for everyone. This is particularly true with pe for people who have disabilities that affect communication. You know, sometimes there's verbal speech. Sometimes verbal speech looks typical. Sometimes it looks different, like repeating phrases, using memorized phrases, odd syn syntax or what whatever, but so speech, typical or atypical, can be very useful. Body language and pointing, non-speech sounds, typing using letter boards, using picture symbols, communication device devices, some people use interpreters, some people use combinations. This is not an exhaustive list. It's an example of some ways people communicate. And, you know, so keeping in mind that communication takes many forms, both expressively and receptively. So if we want to be good at communication, if we want to be good listeners, we need to get good at listening to a wide range of different types of communication. And one thing that means is, for instance, people, with, people who use augmentative communication um, generally have different kinds of con conversational timing because spelling out, because typing out a message creates different kinds of pauses than verbal speech does. So learning that kind of conversational pattern and conversational flow is part of listening to someone. Learning to tell when vocalizations somebody is making are meaningful and what they mean or what idiosyncratic word use might mean or what like pointing might mean and nonverbal body language might mean. Because people who are non-speaking often develop really strong body-based communication skills. And sometimes that gets ignored in the interests of encouraging speech. But if we want to communicate with people, we have to listen. And that means listening to a broad range of communication. So part of what community communication and reciprocity means is we've got to be in it for the long haul. Because establishing communication can take time, effort, and trial and error just in terms of developing skills, troubleshooting, finding the right skills. It can also take a long time to build trust because people with communication impairments often learn that people don't want to listen to them or that they'll be punished for trying to communicate or any number of other things. So it can take a long time to build certain types of trust, certain types of communicative relationships. And we need to remember that this is a long haul project, both for our interactions with individual people, for our relationships with communities, and for our general skills at communicating with 
people in general. It's a long-term project. It's not something that we just learn some skills for overnight and then we're done. We gotta keep going. Um, and now I'm gonna get into some like really concrete things that I think are very often worth trying with a range of people. One thing that I think is really important is to address people directly. Um, including people who have never responded in a way that you understand, including people who are accompanied by people who don't think they can communicate, even if you're not sure they understand you at all. People understand respect whether or not they understand words. And when people know that they're listening, they're more likely to keep trying. And if you address somebody directly, it sends a really powerful message about seeing them as a person, about seeing them as important, and about seeing them as somebody who's invited into the conversation. And it will also change your attitude towards them and the attitude of people around them. So again, this is something that it can be hard to remember to do, but like reminding yourself that you need to address people directly and that you, know, you need to pay attention to whether you're addressing people directly can really make a lot of communication possible. Um, and it's often worth being explicit about what you're doing. So for instance, you can say, I don't understand what you're saying, but I'd like to. Your opinion's important to me. I want to listen to you. Something else that indicates that like, you see them as having a perspective. You want to know what it is. And you're not afraid of acknowledging that. And over time, if you keep inviting people in, often it eventually works. And often if it creates more space for mutual reciprocity of effort. Um, so another concrete thing is that communication can involve a lot of guesswork. When we're communicating with anyone, that's true, but especially when people's communication is atypical and we don't have as much feedback as we're used to having, um, it involves making a lot of guessing and making sure that we are paying attention to what we're guessing based on improving the quality of our guessing and being clear about when we actually know something and when we're guessing. Um, Cause we don't know, we don't always know what someone's thinking. We can have a pretty good guess, but if we can't verify it, it's still a guess and we need to remain aware of that or we'll end up inadvertently overriding people's voices. So we need to work to make good guesses and to keep improving the quality of our guesses. One principle that helps with that is principle that silence is not absence. So when someone isn't responding, we don't know what they're thinking, we're guessing. When someone isn't responding in a clear way that we understand, we also don't know what their cognitive abilities are. You know, some people with com significant communication barriers also have very significant language comprehension disabilities or intellectual disabilities. Some people don't. And if we don't have reliable communication with someone, we also don't have a reliable means of knowing where they're at intellectually. So we have to be careful about the assumptions we're making and the range of guesses we're making and why and how we're checking. So it's important, and again, it's important to err on the side of assuming that people are capable of understanding you and that they have opinions about what you're saying and that their opinions are important and that we always need to be clearly respectful. Um, and I think that this is also important to reflect in our documentation if we're in a role where we're documenting interactions with people with disabilities. Because when I've worked in certain settings, every time I saw somebody document that somebody had no communication, I saw that as a circumstance that made it pretty urgent to try and communicate with them and document it. Because once somebody is in a system as seen as incapable of communicating, that will affect how others treat them and it can become very dangerous very quickly. Um, and what we put in documentation and what we say to others about someone's communication can have a really big impact. So don't say they have no communication. Say something like, I was not able to establish clear communication or here's what I tried and here's what they did. Um, but often, 
if you try, there are some potentially communicative things. Um, and if you see things that you think might be communication, it's worth documenting that both for your own reference and for increasing the chances that other people will see them as capable of communicating and try to communicate with them. So some other things we can try is, and again, this is related to being careful about our assumptions, is that it can be worth trying different kinds of language. Um, some people find simpler language easier to understand um, and find like longer or technical language harder to understand, but that's not universal. And we need to be careful about that assumption because some people find precise clinical or technical language much easier to understand than simplified language. So the fact that someone's not responding in a way that we understand does not in and of itself tell us what kind of language works better for them. So if somebody doesn't under seem to respond well to simpler language, it's worth trying using more technical or complex language um, and vice versa, because we don't, if, if we're not getting clear feedback, then we don't know. And if we don't know, it's best to try multiple things because if we like, hold space for uncertainty and um, try multi multiple things, it increases the chance that one of them will work. Similarly, trying different speeds can help. Some people follow better if things are slowed down. If we speak more slowly, if we you know, use slower speeds for various things. But for some people, that actually makes communication harder because it can be easier to get distracted um, or for various other reasons. So if going slower doesn't work, it can be worth trying going faster because for some people, speed makes a big difference. And if we're not getting a clear response, we don't know one way or the other. So it can be worth trying both. Another thing that's worth trying is wait time. And in education space, we call this the seven second rule. When you ask someone a question, wait at least seven seconds before moving on, um, because that gives them time to process the question and think about it and figure out how to respond. And when you're the one asking the question, seven seconds feels like a very, very long time um, because you're anticipating responses. It can be very tempting to jump in and like say more to clarify, but that tends to overwhelm people. So it's much better to wait a certain amount of time um, before you say anything else, just to give people processing space. That can often in and of itself make a really big difference. Um, and if somebody has a communication disability and seven seconds doesn't seem to be making a difference, it can be worth trying to wait longer because some people dramatically have more ability to respond if you give them more time to think and if you give them more time to formulate it. Um, so, and it helps to like explicitly count to yourself in your head how many seconds it's been because it feels much longer than it is from the perspective of someone waiting for a response. Um, another thing we can try that often helps is yes or no questions. Um, and if somebody has no other communication that you understand, um, you can often try asking, can you show me yes? Can you show me no? Because some people have established nonverbal ways to say yes and no that are not documented anywhere. And sometimes if you find out, if you ask them, you can find out. You can also try, um, you know, giving them things to point to for yes and no or various things like that. But you can get a lot of mileage out of yes or no questions if you ask the right questions. Um, so you can spend some time thinking about what people in the situation they're in are likely to have opinions about. You can write scripts for yourself for use in various situations where you might need to assess something. Um, you know, and you, you can ask and then like solicit their input. And you, there's a limit to what you can do this way, but if you're creative with it, you can do a lot with yes or no questions. Another thing you can do that 
it's an even more powerful method that allows for a certain amount of error corrections, is o more open-ended two-choice questions. Because somebody, sometimes people who can't formulate a lot of um, explicit, like original expressive communication do understand a lot and can respond if we give them a this or that kind of thing. So they can be simple, like, do you want X or Y? But they can also be more open-ended, like, do you want X or something else? Um, they can also mean this, they can also, it can also be a good way to check our assumptions, especially with people who use non-standard speech or echolalia or repeat a lot of phrases in a potentially communicative way that might be atypical, we can you can tell them what your guess is. Say like, I think you're saying why. Like, I think you're talking about hats. Am I getting that right, or do you mean something else? And then you can keep checking your guesses um, until you get it right. And that can be a really powerful way of narrowing it down and of effectively listening to somebody who might need more support in being understood. And this can be effective with a pretty wide range of people who have trouble with word finding. Um, so another aspect of making good guesses, and this is a place where it's going to get a little more abstract again, because this is a huge topic that we could do many series on, um, is that cultural competence is part of making good guesses. Um, and it's part of understanding the context that we and others are operating in. So the person you're working with comes from a culture. Everyone comes from a culture. Everyone is part of various subcultures. Um, for some people, one of them is the majority culture. Some people are also part of minority cultures. Some people are part of disability subcultures or a subculture around, say, football or um, whatever else it is they're interested in. And the more we understand about different cultures and about the more we can make better guesses about where people might be coming from and um, that we can then check and create better mutual understanding. Um, so here's some examples of why it matters. Um, for instance, is there a reason to think that an upcoming religious or cultural holiday might be important to someone? That matters for under, for like facilitating and supporting somebody's involvement in communities they want to be part of. It also matters for understanding what um, the emotional context for somebody might be in a given moment, because holidays can be great, but holidays can be really hard on people especially holidays which in their culture are a big family thing can be very fraught especially for people who are alone so being aware of like just thinking about is it a holiday for them what might that mean what do we need to be checking on um is someone from a culture in which eye contact is considered considered rude that might affect what various interactions might mean um is someone from a cultural group that's currently under attack? And are there things that might be likely to seem threatening or affirming? Um, and might the person you're communicating with have reason to be wary of people from your background? Which, you know, and the answer to that is often going to be yes. And we can't take that personally. We just have to deal with the reality that that's part of the context and we need to you know, take it into account in an appropriate and constructive way. Um, you know, for instance, if you're white and you're working with someone who's a person of color, they might have reason to be concerned that there might be a reason to expect racist behavior from you, regardless of who you are or what you do or what you're like. People have to make certain assumptions and guesses and cautions in order to be safe in the world. Um, you know, if somebody's Jewish, they might like not come in with, they might not know whether or not you'll respect that. They might not know, they might not know, are you somebody who might try to convert them to another religion? Are you someone who's going to respect their holidays and their 
need to connect in certain ways that might not be as present in the majority culture. All of that, like understanding that our roles um, affect things in these ways is an important part of communication, reciprocity, and respect. Um, and I think that we all need to keep that in mind and think about what that means and how to deal with it constructively. But one caution about this is that cultures are complex. We need to be aware of not falling into stereotypes. And everyone is an individual person. And like we can't assume cultural conformity um, just based on cultural membership. For instance, not all Jewish people keep kosher. Some Jewish people might celebrate Christmas or do various other things. Not everyone shares their parents' political views. People from, cons from conservative cultural backgrounds might be like LGBTQ and they might have an affirming community. So we have to be careful about assumptions. One way I've put this when I've done this presentation in San Francisco is that if you assume that parents speak for their children, um, you'd have a lot of parents who will swear up and down to you that their children hate sugar and television. A lot of them are wrong and that's okay. And taking account for cultural context is important, but remembering that cultures are complex, so are people and people are individuals also really matters. And and our guesses are guesses. So disability related cultural competence also really matters um, because disability is not just a physical or medical experience, it's also a social experience. And there are a lot of different disability cultures and subcultures and shared commonalities of experience. For instance, there's the intellectual and developmental self-advocacy movement. There's the autistic self-advocacy movement. There's cultural experiences people might have in special education. There's the neurodiversity movement, um, Center for Independent Living Culture and all of that. And being aware of disability, not just as like a mechanical experience, but as a social and cultural one and as something that has its own cultures and subcultures affects the guesses, affects the guesses that we're making and the mechanisms for checking our guesses. So one example of cultural competence when it comes to like autism related culture is that sometimes there are a lot of fights over autistic versus person with autism because that word has different cultural connotations depending on what subculture you identify with. Within the self autistic self-advocacy and neurodiversity movements, autistic is generally what's considered the most respectful in the same way that like you would not call me like a person with femaleness or a person who happens to be Jewish or a person who happens to have ordination. Like, and that would not be perspective see disrespectful if you did like some people feel really strongly that like autism is part of their identity and that autistic is the most like respectful way to describe that um this is often very surprising to clinicians and special educators who have often been told in no uncertain terms that person first language the only way to be respectful and that using an adjective is like terrible, bad, wrong, dehumanizing. Um, and the intellectual and developmental disability self-advocacy movement generally does prefer person-first language. So this has various different cultural connotations and it's important to respect culture, like the existence of these different cultures and subcultures and people's self-identification as something that might have some big connotations for them and that we shouldn't be telling them they're wrong about because people get to decide how to describe themselves what their own identity is what communities they're part of and i think that that cultural competence and aware of the ranges of things those words mean to people is really important for people in professional disability related roles um so another autism related example of like some assumptions that are worth considering, some guesses that are worth making, is that 
autistic people are often trained to pass as neurotypical in ways that can undermine communication. People may be afraid to communicate with you and they may be afraid that you will hurt them if they look too autistic or if they look too atypical. Um, passing can interfere with communication because looking neurotypical is not the same as being neurotypical and being able to, under some circumstances, maintain a certain affect and speak in a certain way is not the same as being cured or being cognitively typical. Um, and there's a couple reasons for this. One reason is that the cognitive resources and energy that are used to artificially maintain a certain affect um, have to come from somewhere. And often where they come, they come from are at the expense of like more meaningful communication and more reciprocal interaction. Um, and to give an example of this, one of the times I got angriest in seminary. So when we were having a communication seminar, um, teaching us like, how to give a good sermon, how to not bore people to death when we're speaking to them in public. And one of the exercises they had us do um, was they had us like hold our hands behind our back and hold still and try to have a conversation. And the point being made was that that makes it a lot harder. And so if we like maintain this wooden still pose when we're speaking, it actually makes it harder for us to communicate and engage with an audience. And I was thinking, wait a minute, so everybody knows this, but what do we say to even little children with really severe communication impairments? Like we tell them, you know, hold still, hands down, quiet hands, don't rock, don't move. And we know that makes communication harder. And we do that to people who already have significant barriers to communication. And I think that we really need to knock that off and that we need to create spaces where that is not the expectation and like let people use their, their cognitive resources for communication. Um, the other thing, the other way that passing can interfere with communication is it can mean that people's communication and what they can express is narrowed down to a very narrow range of things that they have like memorized ways to communicate in a way that looks typical. And that's not, and that might make that communication look typical, but it also means that they're having all of these thoughts and opinions, ideas, feelings that they can't express safely because they could not express those and still look normal. Um, and so it can interfere with communication, both in the sense of being a drain on cognitive resources and restricting communication to a narrow range of really rehearsed things. Related to this, eye contact is really overrated. And in disability support settings, like we really need to stop emphasizing it so much. Here's when we, we know it's overrated. So because of the pandemic, most of us have not been interacting with very many of our like friends, co um, family and colleagues in person. And we've been doing most of our communication um, on settings for which eye contact is not really possible. For instance, Zoom, um, email, Slack, how phone, however we're staying in communication. And it's still meaningful communication. It's still possible. It's still reciprocal. And we still find ways of signaling respect, attention, listening to each other. And so I think that that should be a reminder to all of us that eye contact is one way to communicate certain things. It's not the only thing and we can't afford to teach it as a prerequisite because if we do, we end up silencing people. Like imagine if right now we just said, you know, well, we can't make eye contact over Zoom, therefore it's not communication and we shouldn't. But that's what we're doing to people with disabilities when we make eye contact a prerequisite for listening. So we need to knock that off. Got to prioritize listening. Another way to put this is no one likes to be around people who turn every conversation into a nitpicky etiquette lesson. But that's often how disability professionals fall into treating people with disabilities. Um, and, you know, like, we just need to prioritize listening more and not be so invested in making everything into a lesson and eye contact posture 
affect tone. Like if you want someone to communicate, we've got to communicate with them and we have to treat them as someone who's already worth communicating with. Um, because nobody likes to be around people who like treat them as a project rather than a person. And part of improving our communication skills and our cultural competence is we have to be prepared to learn from people with disabilities in settings where we are not clinically engaging with them and we don't have power over them. Because many disability experiences are common. Many of them are very high risk to express to people who have power over you. A lot of people with disabilities have written and created videos about many experiences and perspectives that it's really important for us to be aware of and that might not be part of our professional training. So we've got to seek it out proactively. And learning a range of disability perspectives can enable us to make better guesses about what someone's communication might mean, where they might be coming from, and what we need to be asking about. Another way to put this is that disabled people aren't just individuals. It's true that like everyone's unique, everyone has a unique perspective, everyone has like, a unique range of abilities. And I think that sometimes in professional disability support culture, we get we want to avoid diagnostic overshadowing and diagnostic overshadowing and stereotyping. And we end up sometimes overcorrecting and being really afraid to acknowledge commonality of experience um, and being afraid to acknowledge that disability means something and that it's a shared experience. So disabled people aren't just individuals. There's also commonality of physical and social experiences. There are also disability subcultures that people are sometimes part of. And the shared things matter too because we live in a society and nobody wants to be a totally isolated, unique person nobody else can relate to. Like our shared commonality of experience and having ways to express that is important. And our similarities and differences define us in different and complementary ways. Um, so one of the harder realities of moving towards a more respectful and reciprocal type of communication with people with disabilities so our culture is very ableist in a lot of ways. We have a lot of embedded prejudice and discrimination against people with disabilities. And in an ableist culture, mutual respect is countercultural and will cause us to need to go against the grain sometimes because we're socialized not to listen to certain people. We're socialized not to be understandable to certain people. And we have to learn new skills that enable us to really be in reciprocal re relationship with a broader range of people and to be more respectful and to do things that might not be counter, um, might not be culturally normative. And one of the prices we pay for this is that once you see it, you can't unsee it. And it will change your relationships because if you really gain an embedded, the more you gain an embedded ability to treat people with disabilities respectfully and as communicators and be in reciprocal relationship, um, the more you notice when other people you don't, when other people are not respectful in those ways. And it can really change your relationships with colleagues, with family members, with a lot of people who you interact with, because if you are respectful of others in a way that is not culturally mainstream, it takes you outside of the cultural mainstream and it increases the extent to which you face certain types of prejudice that, the, that people with disabilities face, even if you don't have a disability yourself or even if you don't have that kind of disability yourself. Um, and some of this change can be really hard. Some of the shifts in relationships can be really hard, particularly when you're seeing ableism in your professional culture among colleagues who you really value. Um, and so I think just like being aware that this can be like really emotionally difficult and that we sometimes pay a price for it and that we sometimes start paying a price for it before we start reaping the benefits of it. And we need to hold space for doing the emotional work of finding ways to be okay with that, finding ways to um, 
not get hurt too badly by it. But also to remember that the price we pay is worth it because being able to respect people is great and the relationships that we can build that are based on mutual respect and based on a culture of respect are amazing and it's worth it. And I think that the more we all keep trying, the better off we'll all be. Um, so thank you very much. And at this point, we'll move to Q&A. OK, we're back with Rabbi Rudy Regan. Um, I have to say that I could listen to you all day. And I, everything that you said are the ingredients for a world that I hope for my daughter and every human being. So I have a few questions to follow up with. Um, I wanted to ask you, so in, in another talk that you gave, which I also loved, uh, you mentioned how um, not all behavior is communication. And for many non-speaking people, you know, or people with communication disabilities, um, obviously like we all need to be very attuned to what they're communicating through their bodies. That's a very big sticking point for me because my daughter communicates that way as well. Um, but could you elaborate more on that and why is that important? I was just hoping you'd ask me that because I realized mm -hmm. I'd cut some of that for the sake of time and then I regretted it. So behavior as communication is a little bit slippery as a concept um, because you know, people will say things, well, like, what is the behavior of communicating? Well, behaviors don't communicate, people do. And I think that it can end up being a way to sort of elide the fact that somebody has a perspective. And everything observable might be information. It might tell us something. But not everything we observe is communication. And not everything we observe is intended as communication. And I think that that framing can end up sort of alighting the fact that people have a perspective and communicate intentionally in that reciprocal interaction as possible. And another way I put this is that nothing I have ever done was, was ever intended to communicate, please follow me around with the clipboard, making a lot of like intrusive check marks, um, documenting everything I do that you think might be relevant to modifying my behavior in some way. Um, nothing I have ever done ever meant that, but to hear like what people who say behavior is communication talk, you would think that a lot of people with disabilities are asking for that constantly, and I really don't think that's true. So I think that we have to be a little cautious about that principle and that we need to be, um, willing to like be very intentional about listening for perspective and meaning something reciprocal and humanizing when we talk about communication. Um, and the other, the other problem with just the concept of behavior is that it can end up pushing us into a mindset where we explain everything in terms of like observable, tangible reinforcers or punishers. And that's really not the only reason people do things. Like some things are physically involuntary. Sometimes when people don't do things, I don't know why my phone is doing this, apologies. But sometimes when people, sometimes when people um, don't do things, it's not because they're insufficiently motivated, it's because those things are not possible for them. And so I think we just need to be careful about how much we're attributing to extrinsic reinforcement and punishment. And remember that perspective is part of it too. Um, because, you know, nobody stormed the beaches of Normandy um, as like sensory seeking behavior. Like people's sense of themselves and morality and ethics and what matters to them, what defines who they are as a person, what's honorable and what isn't, um, and you know, feelings 
respecting feelings and paying attention to reinforcement are not actually the same thing. So I think that in terms of behaviorist communication, sometimes it means something constructive, but it can be a very slippery concept that I think we need to be careful about. So does that answer what you were asking? Yes, absolutely. And just to piggyback off of that a tiny bit is that many times behavior is just movement, which I've heard you yeah. say. It. And so I think, you know, even that is, is a very important thing to keep in mind um, because not every movement is intentional. Right. Okay. So the next question is, um, you talked about wait time, which is another really important thing because mm -hmm. Many times people with disabilities are just rushed, you know, people are not giving them the opportunities to respond, you know, with the processing time that they need. So I wanted to ask you what you think about prompting and the, um, the um, amount of time that that typically happens in, in many uh, classrooms or inter interventions and um, you know, what are the implications long-term of over-prompting? Um, I think that prompting can often end up, end up prioritizing the appearance of communication over actual communication. Um, because reinforcing visibly communicative behavior is not the same as listening. Um, and it's not the same as giving someone space to respond. And I think that there are different kinds of prompts. There are prompts that are very closed. There are prompts that are very specifically aimed at getting people to do particular things. And I think that closed prompts or like overly prescriptive prompts are inherently very dangerous. There are also prompts, but there are also people who really do have a lot of trouble initiating and really do need certain supports and being able to initiate things. And I think that we need to get better at developing consent practices around prompting yes. and ways of checking in with people about what's welcome and what's not. And to be able to say that like, look, sometimes the answer is no. And if the only answer we're willing to hear is yes, then we're not really supporting communication. We're just like being controlling. And, you know, sometimes there's reasons to insist on certain things, especially with young children. But there's a difference between insisting on something and pretending that somebody has chosen to do what we want them to do or pretending that someone has communicated what we want them to communicate. And I think that like with prompting for communication teaching. I think that there is often not as much caution as there should be about making sure that people have the opportunity to error correct. Like I've seen so many people do things, especially with single message switches where they put one message in it and then put somebody's hand on it and then say that person has said something. Well, no, they haven't. You know, somebody said something if it reflects what they wanted to say and what they chose to say. And I've seen this in religious settings as a way of facilitating participation in prayer um, where people will preload certain things and have them say that. And that's, not supporting communication, that's prompting certain things. And that can happen with speech too. And especially intense social skills training. It's not just physical contact that creates problems. It's intense training can tr train people to have a high degree of prompt responsiveness to what somebody in a position of power seems to want from them that can really undermine communication. So I think that we have to be really careful about what we think we have the right to do and what we don't and why, and about creating ways for people to have more agency and self-directing supports, including prompting, because there's a big difference between prompting that somebody wants, prompting that somebody doesn't want, prompting that someone has agreed to, and prompting that someone has imposed on them.
And I think that often there's a temptation to get too caught up in power struggles. So the thing is, like, any parent of a, knows that you know, sometimes a two-year-old child will win power struggles, and that's okay. And that's like part of growing up. Sometimes teenagers will win power struggles and that's okay. And that's part of growing up. But sometimes like in special education or disability specific contexts, or even in inclusive education with a lot of like intrusive oversight, there can be this idea that we always need to win power struggles. And even with young children, that's inappropriate because you know, sometimes we're going to get stuff wrong and people have the right to have agency and we need to be like less invested in always winning. Yeah. So does that answer what you were asking? Yes. And it reminds me um, of when you speak about making good guesses and admitting mm -hmm. that, you know, we are going to get it wrong a lot of the time and we have to be very humble about that and yeah. well admit, you know, that we don't have all the answers and, you know, in order to enable trust between parties, we really have to be willing. Right. And also like, if we respect, if we have reason to suspect prompt over responsiveness, which I think that for some autistic people and for some people with other disabilities, there can be a certain amount of that that's innate and a certain amount of that that's socialized. And it's given what our culture is like, it can be hard to sort out what's what. So there's often reason to suspect that. I think phrasing things in a way that does not suggest a particular response is correct can really enable more communication. Although right. it can also take a lot of trust because people who are afraid of giving the wrong answer, you know, yeah. might not feel safe with us. So we need to be account for that too. But like making, creating as few like forced choice situations as possible helps with that. And also like supporting a way to com have people communicate if they're feeling like they're being prompted into stuff they're not okay with. Because sometimes if you ask, people can tell you. Right, right. Not um, always, but sometimes. Yeah, and it's always important to listen to that. Um, okay, so I think my last question is, um, you know, we talk a lot about reciprocity and ableism that's within our culture um, and you know, even in so-called inclusive settings, ableism is still there. Um, usually the burden is more on, you know, the disabled person than the non-disabled people to um, conform, you know, in, in different ways and act in certain ways. Um, so what do you think is um, a, a good social skills group? Are there good social skills groups? And the last question would be, you know, there's so much um, focus on, you know, disabled, say in schools, you know, we have plans for disabled children and, you know, they have IEPs and everything is focused on, you know, remediation of skills and things like that. Um, what about the other kids who are in the school who also need to learn about disability just as much? Um, so the two part question is, um, do you think social skills groups are good? And then how do we help promote inclusion, real true inclusion within schools? Um, what I will say about social skills groups is that I've seen it done badly and I have never seen it done well. Um, and I think that, you know, there's various really common problems for instance, like heteronormativity is often a really big problem. So if you want to talk about socially expected behavior, socially expected behavior for like a 13 year old girl is like being into boys and makeup, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and also like being socially expected behavior is like being a girl if other people think you're a girl, you know, or like, and that's, a problem and the other another common problem with social skills groups is that they end up training people what we wish the rules were rather than what they actually are like always tell a 
teacher if someone's bullying you is not actually good advice but it's like the advice that we wish was good yeah and it and i think that it can also teach people that they have to be normal at all costs and that their feelings don't matter and that they can't challenge social norms which i think is dangerous and i think that especially i worry about it particularly for young white men because i think that it can be a path into some pretty destructive things because if you teach people that there are rules that if you follow them it will mean people have to be your friend or that if you do certain things people will have to be your friend and you'll be popular and people will like you and want to date you well that's dangerous mm -hmm. and the thing is groups like pickup artistry groups or like you know various other types of really toxic masculinity groups which are often like associated with like whiteness and racism as well teach you rules that work better they'll teach you rules like the rules that those groups teach for like how to violate women's boundaries and get away with it how to like manipulate people into sleeping with you that works better than the social skills stuff and it feels affirming to people in certain ways so i think that we can end up i think that there are a lot of potential unintended consequences to how we teach people these formulaic ways to socially interact and it can also if we teach people implicitly that a friend is anyone who will put up with you that can also make people very vulnerable to abuse yes. and it can and i think like so that's like one part of your question is i think that social skills groups like are kind of rooted in assumptions about normativity and deficits that create a lot of problems um, and I think that the skills people really need are like not skills to make them more normal, but skills to like deal with the fact that, you know, we're, you have to be a person and treat other people well and find ways of doing that that makes sense for you in a culture that's going to tell you you're wrong no matter what you do. Um, and, you know, one group social skills things social skills groups often teach is never take the last piece of pizza well someone's got to take it and if like we define disabled people as like the people who should never have resources that other people might want like what are we telling people about themselves right yeah you know, and like in terms of inclusive settings one thing that i've seen happen a lot is that the presence of disabled people is seen as an imposition that then disabled people owe it to other people to compensate for by like being compliant being no trouble being like friendly and smiley or inspiring or whatever else it is right. um and i think that we need to reframe that and say that there's no reason people ever should have been excluded to begin with and yes there are problems that can you'll come about and require things from other people, but the disabled person is having a harder time and like excluding people is wrong and it's always been wrong. And it's as hard as it is now because we haven't been doing it all along and we haven't learned how to do it because we've been neglecting something. And so we're in a hole, we gotta stop digging. Um, and I also think that part of this is reframing how we teach social expectations and social emotional reciprocity and starting really young like i think that if you look at early childhood centers even the ones that work really hard to be inclusive will describe their three-year-old's class as oh this is the time when your child will learn to talk and put on their pants and have more independence in this and so it starts really young, this like socializing, like what it means to be three and part of a community and to grow up in a way that doesn't really have a lot of space for disability. And I think that if when we're teaching kids emotional regulation and emotional reciprocity and listening, if we teach kids in a very matter of fact way, you know, people communicate in different ways, listening is everybody's job, explaining is everybody's job, like, what did you do to listen? Um, 
how can you be more understandable? You, know, you use different words with littler kids, but you can teach them multiple strategies and we can teach an expectation that we include people who communicate differently and that we deal with our feelings about, well, you know, sometimes that's frustrating, but everything's frustrating when you're two. Right. You know, everything's, and like we expect three-year-olds to learn to cope with all kinds of frustrating things, but sometimes like disability gets treated as a step too far. Mm -hmm. You know, so like the more we have this normative expectation of, Communi of communication and social reciprocity in a way that includes everyone, which means we have to rethink how we teach it and how we enforce it and how we supervise it. So like, we would never try to teach caring and sharing by having a caring and sharing day and then not teaching it across the curriculum. But we often try to teach disability that way. Like, yeah. let's have a disability awareness day. But no, you have to teach it consistently across the curriculum, integrated into everything else, or we don't get anywhere. Right. And so, and I think that in terms of teaching about disability, I think often people forget that kids with disabilities actually have a greater need to understand disability. And I think that we get caught up into thinking that we need to teach people with disabilities how to understand being normal. And then we need to teach people without disabilities um, how to be more tolerant or something but really like disability is part of the world right and like and see it's like it's like gender right like we don't want to make everything about gender all the time make it like the only thing about people that matters but we're not afraid to use like gendered words with children or to like teach them words that people might use to describe themselves right. um and that's just like doing it in an integrated way that makes room for everyone without, without being weird about it and expecting reciprocity from everyone. It's easier said than done, but if we go in with that attitude, yeah. there's a lot of opportunities to make things a lot better. And kids really do take their cues from adults. So right. It's so important for the adults to be aware that, you know, yeah ways that they're interacting and the words that they use are what the other children all around them are going to pick up on. So, you know, having that in mind, um, it's really, it just really reiterates that, you know, our approach and our, um, the feelings that we make our disabled students feel are what right. matters. Right, and there's also like adults respond to our cues too, but yeah. it's a lot easier the younger people are, and like even like one year being one year older even makes certain things harder because of just because then you're countering certain things, and it's much easier the younger we start. Um, but it's never too late either. Yeah, and one thing I get asked a lot by like educators who teach children is like how to like so we're doing all of this academic stuff to integrate people um but like social inclusion is not working and they're like being left out and so part of what I talk about is like this are you teaching this expectation of like reciprocity and communication but another thing I ask is like are there any disabled employees in your school like, do they ever see, like, teachers, are there any disabled teachers? Do they ever see you interact with someone who they know is disabled? Because yeah. if you see it as, like, they're not going to believe you to nearly the same extent if what they see adults doing right. does not reflect how you're telling them they should respond to disability. And I think that reminds me of another question I had, but I know we're getting almost close out of time. But um, when people have, you know, autism experts in their schools, I have never seen a school have an autistic person. Right. You know, and so it's, it's, it's like that right there is a great opportunity to, you know, actually include disabled people in um, right. teaching the school community. 
Right, and it's not just that people in that role are almost never openly autistic, probably are almost never autistic themselves, but also have been educated in a context where they don't realize that that's, that they need to listen to autistic people and where all of their knowledge is gained from like being taught by people who are not autistic about, you know, we have in the disability community saying like nothing about us without us. And it's like, it's ludicrous. It's just like, if we had professional organizations where everyone empower, were like about women's empowerment and making the world better for girls in schools and everybody working with them was a man who had only really been taught by man, men expect, except, except on like maybe some very special presentation days where they like heard an inspiring story from a woman, like that would not get anywhere. Yeah. You know, because it's just outrageous. <laughs> like you have to, and it's like, it's a huge cultural competence gap and it's a huge, like what looks like a good idea from the perspective of somebody who's never been in that position themselves or listened to somebody in that position who they didn't have power over. Right. Just there's, there's a huge understanding gap and that's something that it's important to be aware of in schools that if we don't get the cultural competence and like disability perspective part right we're going to make a lot of prevent avoidable mistakes yeah. um and we should be proactive about listening to the perspectives that can help us get it right yeah well rudy i really could listen to you all day and i hope that you'll come back because everything yeah. you have say is just so empowering and it does us all well to be open to this you know, like you said you know it may be difficult for some people to kind of reevaluate the way you've thought about certain things but um you know having these conversations is so important to changing the narrative and to making sure that we're respecting the humanity of everyone so thank you so much for joining us and i really hope you will come back sometime <laughs> thank you and to be continued i hope yes